In April 2009 we had our first close encounter with authentic British Indian bureaucracy. Registering with an Indian telecommunications company for two post-paid SIM cards, we not only had to fill out several carbon copied forms, delivering absurd data such as the names of our parents, but of course also had to provide copies of our passport and visas. In addition one letter was required from our embassy stating that they were familiar with our existence, plus an additional letter confirming our home address in India. All of these papers had to be signed by us separately, adding up to seven to eight signatures for each of us. Wow! The process went on. We would be test called on the new phone numbers during the next hours. And, still not over, a company employee would show up and announce during the next few days at my wife's workplace to ask whether she in fact is really employed and properly registered there. Then for the ultimate assurance of our trustworthiness, we again needed to leave cross-signed photocopies of passports and visas at the reception desk of my wife's employer. Naturally, yeah! There seems to be much mistrust and similar procedures have become normal, especially in India. There seems to be heavy mistrust on the side of your company, we repeated. No, not at all. Replied the senior salesman of the big corporation immediately, who was visiting us at my wife's office. It is all the government. There is so much terrorism now in India. Despite the very friendly staff at the telecommunications company, the story went on and turned us a bit sour. One year on and the corporation's services are generally working fine. Nevertheless, I do get funny calls from time to time, like recently when a very polite female voice told me that You are using your mobile phone too little. I was baffled but soon recollected my senses and silently explained to myself that they might have been concerned that something had happened to me and out of concern were calling to see if I was still alive. So I softly replied that we had been on vacation, therefore had made fewer phone calls, and that everything was alright. The voice on the other end persisted, that This is no excuse. I gasped for air, and still very friendly, told her that it was no concern of hers or the company's what I do in my life. She replied with the direct question, Do you think that you are paying too much for our services? Now it was getting a bit odd. Sticking to my previous chivalric tone I patiently explained that I do also have a landline provided by the same company. No effect whatsoever on the bastion of persistence. I was still under suspicion of using the cell phone too little. Somehow we were not listening to each other and were talking at cross purposes. Again I changed my tactics and told the damsel that I am used to only make appointments via cell phone in regards to them meet people in person and talk to them face to face. I do not understand. I emphasized and summarized that I am extremely happy with the services of the company, that I am not at all concerned about the costs which are well affordable. I could virtually see her head shaking in disbelief. She ended our conversation by telling me, At any time you can, for free, call the company's service hotline. If my disease would be getting any worse and I needed professional help. I thanked her heartily, hung up. Walked over to the bookshelf and reached out for a cough cause the castle dot returning to be crazy. Even the sound of this word addles my brains. Orwell too anticipated the bureaucratic regime now manifest in its clinical veiling of the true situation in the world. Quote dot consider for instance some comfortable English professor defending Russian totalitarianism. He cannot say outright. I believe in killing off your opponents when you can get good results by doing so. Probably, therefore, he will say something like this. While freely conceding that the Soviet regime exhibits certain features which the humanitarian may be inclined to deplore, we must, I think, agree that a certain curtailment of the right to political opposition is an unavoidable concomitant of transitional periods and that the rigors which the Russian people have been called upon to undergo have been amply justified in the sphere of concrete achievement." Unquote. 
That exactly sums up how people are treated today by the highly mechanistic apparatus of bureaucrats. Science, language and officialdom are walking the same highway to hell. Real life is often far worse than modern language portrays. We are living in the midst of genocides and incredible atrocities but they are artlessly veiled from our direct observation, and more importantly from the sight of decision makers, by all sorts of hollow phraseology which not only ruins and distorts language but disguises the truth behind the words themselves. It has become almost impossible to break free from this all-pervading bureaucratic vagueness of modern language raining down on us from scientific organs to the tabloids. We are paralyzed and severely affected by it, resulting in a corresponding vagueness in our decisions and actions. Again Norwell, quote, if thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought, quote, and action. Bureaucracies are not only enlarged and promoted through the creation of super-governments such as the United Nations or the European Union, which have increased the number of officials and regulations manifold, but are also generated by new company structures established largely during the 20th century. In the past sole proprietors owned companies, including all liabilities, and there was a certain amount of transparency regarding who really stood behind a business, but now the structure has changed in favor of corporate bodies where the real bosses can hide comfortably behind diverse layers of management and inflation era more complexity. A world without shame would be as boring as a world without secrets and complexities. However, there remains plenty of complexity in nature, in art and in various mystical realms. We do not need to enhance complexity in politics and in the apparatus which undoubtedly is necessary to regulate large societies. Gulp. If you study history, in all cases, during the creation of the EU, the UN and the invention of the corporate company structure, bureaucracy has been deliberately utilized as a tool to hide and camouflage real intentions behind those new structures to design a democratic facade at the front end while simultaneously allowing a small group of unelected elitists to run the show from behind. Truly amazing. A good example is the European Parliament versus the European Commission, in the first one parliamentarians are elected and talk a lot but have not much to decide, while in the latter commissioners slash the commissariat rule in isolation from the direct votes of the masses. The parliament here clearly functions as a front-end camouflage, creating a certain amount of stir and taking care to divert and channel the emotions of the public into a desert of paper. It is an open secret how bureaucrats tend to expand their local power by increasing budgets, extending departments or even creating whole new sections. However, the psychological and sociological origin of this behavior has little to do with the original creation of the structure itself, with the invention of the corporate model or the invention of a super-government and ultimately a world government. The latter was clearly conceived top-down for all three cases. In Proudhon's original definition anarchism was not the absence of order, but a different kind of order a decentralized order, that was not over-regulated by the state but executed and set up by and in the hands of local communities. By the way, he also deemed individual ownership on a small-scale level as essential for a functional society, so that everyone would have his claim and share of private responsibility. Really? Proudhon was also one of the earliest proponents of non-violent change, change that is radical and therefore tackles the roots but is still systemic and only then toppling old structures when new solutions have already been clearly formulated. Okay, I buy it. Regarding his ideas on liberty and freedom, he was far ahead of the power-hungry socialists, who then, sadly enough, had won the first round in the socialist gamble for power. He foresaw with astonishing clarity the Orwellian world of the coming centralized and power-hungry socialism. Quote, to be governed is to be watched, inspected, spied upon, directed, law-driven, numbered, regulated, enrolled, indoctrinated, preached at, controlled, checked, estimated, valued, censured, commanded, by creatures who have neither the right nor the wisdom nor the virtue to do so. To be governed is to be at every operation, at every transaction noted, registered, counted, taxed, stamped, measured, numbered, assessed, licensed, authorized, admonished, 
prevented, forbidden, reformed, corrected, punished. It is, under pretext of public utility, and in the name of the general interest, to be placed under contribution, drilled, fleeced, exploited, monopolized, extorted from, squeezed, hoaxed, robbed, then, at the slightest resistance, the first word of complaint, to be repressed, fined, vilified, harassed, hunted down, abused, clubbed, disarmed, bound, choked, imprisoned, judged, condemned, shot, deported, sacrificed, sold, betrayed, and to crown all, mocked, ridiculed, derided, outraged, dishonored. That is government. That is its justice. That is its morality." Unquote. Gosh, that was extensive. Wanna hear more? Oh boy. If you want to hear more about how the world is knitted and what we can do about it, buy the fabulous Pre-Revolution Handbook from www.absarapublications.com.